A very good evening to one and all, and a warm welcome to the inaugural lecture of the EML series 2018-19. I am Emil Biju, and I would be your host for this evening. At the outset, I'd like to wish all of you a very happy Independence Day. On this day, as we hit yet another milestone in our country's progress as a democracy, let us remember that there have been numerous people whose dedicated service to the nation in various capacities and whose persistent efforts for the cause of improving our governmental organizations has helped us stay affirmed to our values and celebrate our unity and diversity with equal vigor. Today we have with us one of those exemplary personalities whose service to the nation as an IPS officer and whose efforts in introducing constructive reforms in the functioning of the Indian police have won the hearts of many. Mr. Prakash Singh is a distinguished police officer of our country, and through his tenure, he has served in some of the most turbulent areas of India, including Nagaland, Assam, Punjab, Jammu and Kashmir, and Uttar Pradesh. He has been the police chief of Uttar Pradesh and Assam. He has also commanded India's premier paramilitary outfit, the Border Security Force. The government of India, in recognition of his contribution to national security, awarded him the Padma Shri in 1991. Being a prolific writer, he has written six books and over 350 articles for national dailies and journals. Mr. Prakash Singh is also regarded as the architect of police reforms in our country. The PIL filed by him led to the Supreme Court's historic judgment in 2006 on restructuring of the Indian police. He has also had the privilege of being a member of the National Security Advisory Board. Presently, he is the chairman of the Indian Police Foundation, member of the advisory board of Vivekananda International Foundation, and associate fellow of the Joint Special Operations University in the US. Sir, it's our privilege to have you here with us today. May I request National Cadet Corps Group Captain Mr. Ravindran to welcome the chief guest with a fruit basket. May I now invite our distinguished speaker for the evening, Mr. Prakash Singh, to deliver his much anticipated talk on the topic, India's internal security challenges, can the police cope with them? Over to you, sir. Well, greetings to you on the Independence Day. And uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to you on a subject which has been very close to my heart and uh, with which in different theaters of the country I had to deal with. India's internal security challenges, and uh, subsequent to that, whether our security forces are in a position to deal with these challenges. Now, I have outlined, there's numerous internal security challenges, but uh, here it's a very capsule kind of presentation that I shall be giving. <coughs> I've been told that I should be speaking for about 30 to 40 minutes, and after that it will be questions and answers. Actually, the headings given here, I, was, I mean, each one of these would take 45 minutes if I were to speak at length. So for your purpose, I'll try to compress everything in a short form. These are the major challenges which I have outlined here, uh, which we face on the internal security front. The biggest challenge is, of course, that of terrorism, uh, then the separatist movement in Jammu and Kashmir, insurgencies in the Northeast, the Maoist insurrection, and the problem of border management. Talking of terrorism, you see, this is the biggest threat that the country is facing, and I have always held, <clears throat> although during the former government of Mr. Man, uh, when Mr. Manmohan Singh was the Prime Minister, he would always say that the biggest threat to the country is the Maoist insurgency. Even then, I would not agree with him, uh, and I always felt that he was disinclined to mention terrorism for political reasons. But terrorism has always been the greatest threat 
to this country from a long-term point of view. Uh, according to the U.S. Uh, uh, country report on terrorism, India is the third most affected country after Iraq and Afghanistan, and there are about 52 terror groups active in different parts of the country. Now, why the threat of terrorism, I say, is the biggest threat? I would like to explain that. Because the terrorists are opposed to the idea of India. I repeat, they are opposed to the idea of India. It is not that they have a grievance which you could address. You see, if I mean, talking to the Northeast uh, rebels, you can say somebody wants autonomy, somebody wants uh, uh, statehood, etc., uh, etc. Et but the terrorists have no demand as such. They just want to destroy this country. And that is why if they, they uh, commit an incident in Delhi, because Delhi is the political capital of India, they perpetrate incidents of violence in Mumbai, which they have been doing repeatedly, because that is the commercial hub of the country. They uh, would uh, com commit some crime in Bangalore, because that is the IT hub of India. They try to create disturbances in Varanasi and uh, 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 Varanasi and Ayodhya, because that, the idea is to create a religious cleavage, sharpen the communal divide. So they want to destroy India politically, economically, socially, culturally. That is why I say it is the biggest threat. If a group was having a grievance, you could say, all right, let us have a dialogue. Let us talk across the table. But here is a group which does not have a uh, grievance. They just want to establish Islamic rule in India and in the process destroy all that India stands for. And therefore I say this is the biggest threat to the country. <coughs> now, as for terrorist groups are concerned, there are various terrorist groups that we have to <coughs> account for. There is the Islamic State, there is the Al-Qaeda. Islamic State has been very prominent uh, recently. Uh, you are aware that in 2014 Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, he announced the formation, not the formation, but the restoration of caliphate, because caliphate has always been there. He said, I'm restoring the caliphate. And uh, from two, about 2014 to 16, you can say, the caliphate uh, had a meteoric rise uh, in the states of Iraq and Syria. And uh, uh, at its peak, they, they had uh, about a, an army of about 70,000 men, which were fighting for them. And out of these 70,000, it is estimated that about uh, 20 to 30,000 were foreign fighters. From different countries, they had moved to these, uh, this theater of conflict in Iraq and Syria to fight on behalf of the Islamic State. And uh, at its peak, again, I would say, they were raking in about one million per day in terms of revenues, because they had captured a whole lot of uh, oil wells and other government uh, uh, resources. But that was at its peak. But subsequent to a U.S. bombardment of the uh, Islamic State strongholds and Russia also going against them, the, the Islamic State has been in a process of a retreat. They have lost uh, Mosul, they have lost Raqqa, and they are, it is said that about 95% of the territory which they control, they have lost. But that does not mean that Islamic State has lost its uh, capacity to inflict damage. Because uh, there are about uh, 19 or 20 countries across the world which have organizations owing allegiance to or uh, subscribing to the ideology of Islamic State. So Islamic State by itself may not be a threat, but the idea which it has disseminated across the world, the poisonous idea, that is a great threat to peace and stability in different countries of the world. Uh, Al-Qaeda is not so much of a threat, although he has been talking of uh, uh, spreading the, uh, I mean, uh, raising the flag of jihad in the Indian subcontinent. Al-Zawahiri has been talking like that. But, uh, but Al-Qaeda is uh, not so much of a threat. Its uh, uh, capacity to launch attacks is within the country, within India at least, is very, very limited. Uh, these park based outfits, the lashkar e toiba jaish e Muhammad, and Hezbollah Mujahideen, they have been uh, perpetrating violent incidents from um, now and then, mostly in the state of Jammu and Kashmir, and mostly by lashkar e toiba or its uh, a new avatar called jamaat ud dawa About lashkar e toiba I would like to tell you about this man, Hafiz Saeed. If you read his speeches, they are full of venom against India. 
And he has made out no secret of the fact that he wants to see the disintegration of India. In one of his speeches, I'll, I'm quoting from memory, I mean, he was speaking at, uh, from the mosque in Lahore. He said something like this. Uh, 15 years back, if somebody had talked about the disintegration of Soviet Union, people would have laughed at him. Today, from this masjid, I announce the disintegration of India. And inshallah, we shall not rest until the whole of India is dissolved into Pakistan. Quote, unquote. That is the kind of speeches which he has been giving. Uh, so he is the most uh, um, dangerous man for, for this country as far as ideology is concerned. Jaish e Mohammed has been very active in uh, uh, Kashmir, Hezbollah, and so has Hezbollah Mujahideen. Uh, uh, Hezbollah Mujahideen. Indian Mujahideen, Popular Front of India, and Student Islamic Movement of India, these are all indigenous groups which have been active at different periods of time. Presently, they are both, uh, I mean, uh, Simi and Indian Mujahideen are lying dormant, but PFI is active and uh, its activities have spread to different states. I mean, the other day I got a letter from Jharkhand saying that PFI is very active even in Jharkhand. I believe Government of India is, uh, is trying to collect evidence to ban this organization as a terrorist outfit. Uh, in this context, two other matters uh, I would like to draw your attention to, that there is an attempt to revive the terrorist movement in Punjab. And the Sikh diaspora, particularly in Canada and UK, has been working for it. Uh, if you have, a, uh, if you read, the, if you have read the newspapers carefully, uh, the other day there was a rally in Trafalgar Square for what they called Referendum 2020. By which time they want, they say that we should have a separate Sikh state of Khalistan in India. Uh, economic terrorism. This is another dimension that we have to take care of. Uh, that we have to uh, remember. You see, Pakistan has, its effort has always been to disrupt the economy of the country. And for that purpose, they have been pumping in counterfeit currency notes, what they call FICN, fake Indian currency notes, they have been pumping into India. And according to the, an assessment made by the Indian Statistical Institute, at any given point of time, about 400 crore worth of FICN is all the time under circulation. And every year, about 70 crore is sort of infused into India. So this is another dimension of, uh, in fact, one of the mo one of the motives behind FICN, uh, F behind demonetization was to sort of get over this business of FICN, because so that the, that currency automatically gets uh, uh, goes out of circulation. Uh, about Jammu and Kashmir, see, about our handling of Jammu and Kashmir has left much to be desired from the very beginning. From I mean, here I have given a historical overview of the various blunders which we have been committed, which we have been committing ever since 1947. You see, Nehru's uh, referring the matter to uh, United Nations. That was quite unnecessary because uh, that was the time when Indian forces were holding an upper hand and they were in the process of flushing out the invaders. If the, if, the war, if the war had continued for some more time, I think the whole of Kashmir would have been cleared. But at that stage, Nehru made the great uh, blunder of referring the matter to the United Nations. Then, uh, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru again gave an unsolicited, and uh, nobody was asking for this kind of assurance, that the wishes of the people of Kashmir would be ascertained before deciding the final uh, future of the state. Now, there was no need for that. He said that, uh, I mean, just out of his generosity, you can say, but that statement is being quoted to this day that there should be a plebiscite in JNK. Of course, I mean, if, if we are to talk the issue of plebiscite, that again was subject to Pakistan removing, the for, uh, removing its uh, forces and vacating the areas it had committed aggression upon, a condition which has not been satisfied to this day. Then, in 1965, we had Indo-Pakistan war, and the war was settled at Tashkent, where a peace agreement was signed uh, between uh, Ayub and uh, Lal Bahadur Shastri. Now, the unfortunate part was that some uh, strategic gains, like Haji Pir Pass, that was uh, that was sort of handed over to Pakistan in 1965. <coughs> that should not have been done. 
Then Shimla Agreement of 1972. I mean, this was in the wake of liberation of Bangladesh in 1971. You know, in 1971, Bangladesh was liberated, and we were holding 90,000 POWs. Now, Bhutto was almost at Indira Gandhi's feet, crying for mercy at Shimla. That was the time when Mrs. Gandhi could have said, all right, we will repatriate these 90,000 prisoners, but you sign that the line of control will be the international boundary between India and Pakistan. Something like that should have been dictated, and that could have been forced down the throat of Bhutto. But uh, for reasons not known to this day, people say that she was wrongly advised by the bureaucrats around her. Um, and Mr. Haksar was one of the premier uh, advisors at that time, a very celebrated uh, bureaucrat. But uh, the advice was wrong, and uh, we are paying the price of that to this day. Then uh, release of Rubaiya Saeed, when Vishnath Pratap Singh was the prime minister, if you recall, Rubaiya Saeed, daughter of Mufti Muhammad Saeed, was released. And that was the time, uh, I think that marked a turning point in the history of Kashmir, I mean, popular uh, uh, agitations against Kashmir, uh, against government of India in Kashmir. That was a huge blunder. And then further, in 1999, when the, in the wake of uh, hijacking of the Indian Airlines plane, we again surrendered four militants, were handed over by Jaswan Singh, then foreign minister, who went all the way to Kandahar to hand over those militants in Afghanistan to the Taliban. So these are, I mean, we have been making mistake after mistake, and that is, we are paying the price of that. And presently, the main trends in Kashmir are violations of ceasefire, infiltration of terrorists, especially of lashkar e toiba attacks on security forces, increase in stone pelting incidents, and radicalization of youth. You see, the number of youth who have been joining the rebels in 2015, 16, 17 has been steadily going up, 66, 88, 126. And down below is the, some, information about the violence, uh, but Northeast, very briefly. Northeast, as you know, uh, Nagaland uh, is the epicenter of uh, uh, rebellion in the, no in the Northeast. Now, uh, <coughs> we have been having suspension of operations agreements since 1997, and after that, about 60 rounds of talks have been held were held between the government of India and the Naga rebel representatives. That led to the signing of a framework agreement not actually, it is not that, but it was uh, Ravi's efforts, who is the uh, former intelligence officer. His efforts led to the signing of this framework ag agreement in 2015. Uh, but at the time this agreement was signed, we were given an impression that <coughs> very soon the agreement will be, given a fi will be given final touches, but that has not happened to this day. But uh, we are still hopeful that uh, the Naga rebels are coming round and some kind of final settlement would be arrived at. Manipur has about 15 militant groups. Uh, although they don't, they don't have uh, much of uh, a lethal capacity, uh, they have organized a, an organization called CORCOM. It's a coordination committee of valley-based militants uh, just to keep the uh, rebellion alive. But these insurgent groups have become more of extortion groups and groups which uh, wish to control an area over which they uh, claim dominance and where they do extortion and all kinds of other illegal activities. Uh, Assam, Assam Ulfa was the problem in Assam, but Ulfa, the main group, the Arvind Rajkova group has come over ground. They are having peace talks with government of India. But the dissident faction led by Parish Barwa, who was commander in chief of the Ulfa army at one stage, he is still, uh, his uh, probably taking shelter somewhere in the Yunnan province of China. He says, no, unless the core issue of sovereignty is settled, the sovereignty of Assam, I shall not, uh, or, or unless the core issue of sovereignty is discussed with, uh, with uh, and the government of India is prepared to discuss that with us, we are not prepared to have any peace negotiations. So he is still holding on, but he has just about two to 300 men with him. So it's not much of a threat, but all the same, he is there. Now these. Uh, other two, there's one United Liberation Front of Western Southeast Asia. I mean, it's a very hodgepodge group of uh, militant groups in the Northeast. Uh, and one other factor I want to tell you, there is a factory called North Industries Corporation of China. 
this is based in uh, uh, somewhere on China Myanmar border. And uh, this is one factory which produces weapons for insurgent groups in the Northeast. If any insurgent group wants to buy, all he has to do is to establish contact. What they do, they go to Bangkok. Bangkok, these, uh, uh, there's the Norinco people have their representatives. You settle the terms. I mean, I mean we want, say, 1,000 rifles. You pay the amount in Bangkok, and then Norinco would arrange supply somewhere uh, through Bangladesh or through uh, Myanmar. The supply would be arranged. But if you talk to China, China says, no, we are not aware of any such factory. And uh, this is uh, beyond, I mean, not in our knowledge, not with our blessings, and it is not our establishment. Now, in a country like China, if, some, if Myanmar were, were to say that what's happening in North Myanmar, we, we don't really know, that would be understandable. But for China to say that they are not aware of the uh, existence of such a factory is uh, not uh, credible. It is fully within all. Left-wing extremism, this is the, about the, what you call the Naxalbari movement, or now which has, it has metamorphosed into a Maoist movement. Now, the important thing to remember is that, I mean, it was a small spark in Naxalbari, and that gradually has a spread across 10 states of the country. At its peak, and that was in, in about 2010, the movement had uh, affected 220 districts of the country. But since then, the graph has been going down, and more and more districts are being, you can say, uh, being recaptured, not recaptured, but where the security forces are now gradually establishing their dominance. So now they have shrunk to about uh, 90 districts only, uh, out of which 30 are very badly affected. And the states worst affected are Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Odisha, and Bihar. And the level of violence has been gradually coming down. So the area control by them has been coming down, level of violence has been coming down. But at the same time, you have to remember that the geographical spread even today is considerable. They have the potential for violence. They keep on perpetrating incidents even today. And uh, then two other disturbing features are that they are trying to, because of the pressure of security forces in central India, they are trying to uh, spread their influence in the northeast uh, and also in, in, at the tri-junction of Kerala, Karnataka, uh, Kerala, Karnataka, and Tamil Nadu. So th those areas are getting affected. Government of India keeps on telling us that the problem is solved. I mean, yes, uh, as far as violence is concerned, we are probably solving the problem. But uh, I have always held that unless the basic socio-economic reasons are also addressed, the problem is likely to resurrect at a future date. About border management, we have a huge problem of border management. I mean, we are not lucky like USA or Australia, uh, which have hardly any problem of border management. I mean, Australia is surrounded by ocean on all sides. You just don't have to defend. All you have to do is to just do some maritime patrolling. USA, I mean, you have a friendly Canada in the north, and the only kind of problem that you have from the south is for people coming in search of livelihood. But we have a huge problem of border management, and this entire border has to be uh, protected. You can see about 15,000 kilometers of border from China, with China, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Nepal, Bhutan. It has to be protected. Every, every kilometer has to be protected. And apart from that, there is a coastline of more than 5,000 kilometers, and then you have island territories, another two, plus 2,000 kilometers. So it all works out to more than uh, 15, 20, about more than 22,000, 23,000 kilometers. It's a huge problem, and the prob uh, and for securing the borders, you have the border security force, you have the Indo-Tibetan border police, you have the uh, SSB, and you have the uh, coast guards for the maritime. So these forces are there, but as I said, it's a huge, huge problem of border management. Now. These are the major internal security challenges. I have not gone into so many others, like interstate disputes. There are land border, la there are border disputes between, say, Assam and Nagaland. There are riverine disputes between uh, states. Uh, then there's problem of reservation, problem of caste rights, problem of communal violence. I mean, taking all those, that would take another uh, 45 minutes. So I'm just, I've, as I said, I have compressed it to the, these five points. Now the point is, the subject given to me is, Will the police, can the police, Indian police cope with it? Now, before we come to whether the Indian police can cope with these problems, we have to see what is the health of the Indian police. 
what are the resources they have, what are the manpower they have, what is the, whether they have enough vehicles, whether they have enough firepower, whether they have good working conditions. These are the factors that we need to examine. I'll examine briefly those things and then give my answer whether the Indian police is capable of coping with these problems or not. You see, the, the problem with the Indian police is it has a, it's still a colonial uh, structure. The police that we inherited from the, uh, from the British. Remember that in 1857, as you know, there was a rebellion in India. First war of independence, as some people say. Now, in the wake of that, in the, in the wake of 1857, the British, the British were worried. And they said that now we must raise a force which would be at our beck and call, which would carry out our orders, right or wrong, legal or illegal. So they decided to raise a force which, as the minutes of those days say, which will be politically useful. The force should be politically useful. In other words, it should uphold the imperial power in India. That is the background in which we have to see the Act of 1861. Act of 1861, whereby the police, uh, whereby the, uh, the structure of police was defined by the British people. So that was the kind of police they raised, and uh, that was the kind of police they left at the time of departure. It's a tragedy, you can say, uh, another seven, more than 70 years have gone. What have we done so far? Well, frankly, nothing much has been done so far in the last 70 years, and we have allowed the same structure to continue because the political masters who inherited power from the British, they thought that this is a good instrument which we can also use, misuse, and abuse. Right? So they said, Bhai, isko chalne do. Chalne do because this will help me in protecting my people and sort of getting these people involved in false cases, that, this, that. That, that, that is the psychology, though no politician would admit it. That is the psychology uh, behind continuing the uh, old colonial structure. And then, because of, because of the kind of setup, because of the complete exec dominance of the executive over the police, they are able to interfere in the day-to-day -day functioning of the police. And bureaucratic apathy. The, the bureaucrat also likes to dominate the police. He likes to dominate the police. It's like... Uh, some kind of an addiction. You have become addicted to it since 47, that the police must uh, carry out my orders, police must salute me, police must uh, carry out my uh, this, that. So they have become used to it. So bureaucrats also want the status quo to continue. Politicians are happy with the status quo, and so the arrangement continues. This is the main problem. Now, down below, I have written something. I have in, I written the source in very small letters so that you don't, you are not able to read it. But read the first paragraph. The police force is far from efficient. It is defective in training and organization. It is inadequately super supervised. It is generally regarded as corrupt and oppressive. And it has utterly failed to secure the confidence and cordial cooperation of the people. Now, this was recorded in 1902. Fraser Commission, oh, I have written a little bit, what do you want to read? Fraser Commission, 1902-1903. Now, the point is, if you read this excerpt, you get the feeling as if it must have been recorded, say, about, uh, say, four or five years or ten years back, if I had not told you that this was by Fraser Commission. My question is, why has time stood still for the police? Why has there been no change in police and policing during the last, say, more than 115 years? It's a, it's a shame on the Republic. It's a shame on our political masters, but the fact remains. And it is against this structure that I have been campaigning ever since my retirement. For the last 22 years, I have been carrying on this campaign. Yes, I retired 22 years back. <laughs> so so that, this is the problem. This is the basic problem uh, of police, which you need to understand. Uh, there have been various attempts at reforms. In 1979-81, there was a National Police Commission. 
which was headed by very uh, my Mr. Dharambira, a retired ICS officer who was governor of West Bengal, and uh, he was supported. He was supported by some of the finest brains of the country, and they produced a, uh, a report in eight volumes, which is to this day the magnum opus of uh, uh, for for policing. Whenever we have to refer to any important matter, we we want to know what did the National Police Commission say, because we find that by and large what they said then is relevant to this day. Now, the, the police commission, in eight volumes, they submitted their report, they gave their recommendations, but nothing happened. Nothing happened because there was a change of government. This was done by Janta Party, Janta government. Uh, by the time Janta government was defeated, Mrs. Gandhi was back in power, and then she said, no, no, we need not bother, we need not take this seriously. And it was sent to the states, but you know with what kind of note that enclosed is a copy of the uh, Indian uh, National Police Commission which is being sent to you. We do not agree with paragraphs A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. However, you may like to take whatever appropriate action you consider necessary. That is how it was sent. And so the states got the message, okay, the center is not serious, so they were not serious either. And the report remained by and large in the cold storage except some cosmetic changes here and there. The next effort was that is by yours faithfully, Prakash Singh. I went to the Supreme Court in 1996 with a public interest litigation. And what I did, mind you, I did not, uh, I don't claim any copyright for the prayers I made. I just culled out, uh, I mean, the, the cream out of the recommendations made by the National Police Commission and several other commissions and committees which had been set up since independence. And I went up with a prayer to the Supreme Court. It was a 10 hour, it was a 10 year long battle but ultimately the Supreme Court conceded almost everything which I had, which I had prayed for. I was hoping that if I get... Uh, sorry. Uh, these, were the, these were the seven prayers which we had made and all the seven were conceded. First was formation of a state security commission. I won't be able to go into the details of it. Suffice it to say that the purpose of State Security Commission was to insulate police from extraneous pressures. Then selection and minimum tenure of DGP. We said that once a DGP has been selected, after going through all the relevant criteria, he should have a minimum tenure of two years. And it's not that tomorrow you don't like his work, you don't like his face, and you just shunt him out. It happened with me also. <laughs> UP government was tom toming that, oh, law and order is our biggest achievement. Every day they were saying law and order is our biggest achievement. And one day I'm called and said, you can go. Because there was something where they were planning a few months ahead and they knew that this man will create problems. So they said, isko pehle se hatao. A minimum tenure for IG police and other officers who are posted on operational duties. I won't be able to go into the details of all that. I'll leave that for questions. Huh? Then separation of investigation work from law and order. I mean, what it means is, you see, what happens in big cities, every day you have a law and order problem. Law and order problem in the sense that there is a uh, procession somewhere, there is a demonstration somewhere, some VIP is coming here, some communal incident has happened, or I mean, something or the other is always happening in a big city. And in the process, the entire resources of the police get sucked into dealing with that law and order situation. So government said, no, the police commission said, and I repeated this in my prayer, that investigation staff should be separated and they will do investigation work irrespective of what's happening in the district. And law and order work, will there will be separate staff for law and order and they will attend to the law and order duties. Of course, this would require augmentation in the staff. Then uh, next was police establishment board. This was a board of senior police officers to look into transfers, postings. They will have full authority in transfer postings of police officers. <clears throat> then police complaints authority. Well, when you are giving certain amount of author authority uh, to the police, then you must have some monitoring mechanism also. So we said there should be a state, compla com state level complaints authority and a district level complaints authority to look into serious complaints against the police. And then a national security commission, this was like, <coughs> this first six prayers were for the, first six directions were for the state governments and the seventh one was for the central government that there should be a national security commission to look into uh, broader aspects of security. Now, what the states have done, uh, I'll tell you what the states have done. 
the, the Supreme Court judgment contained a sentence which said that these directions are given till such time as the central and the state governments pass their own police acts. Now, this was a mandatory insertion. Why I say mandatory insertion? Because while the Supreme Court can fill a legislative vacuum, but it cannot legislate. You get, you understand, get the difference. So, they said that there is a legislative vacuum, so we are giving these directions. And the moment you, uh, are, you have framed an act, then our directions will not apply. Now, the crooked politicians in several states, what they did, they said to hell with the rest of the judgment, they just picked up the sentence. And they hurried, hurriedly passed acts legitimizing the status quo. You understand? The fun. Whatever the arrangement existed, they said, give it the form of it, an act. So now you can tell the Supreme Court that we have passed an act, so thank you very much. Now you don't have to bother about us. So this is what 17 states have done. And the remaining states have passed executive orders, which also go against the letter and spirit of Supreme Court's direction. I'll close at 4 o'clock. Will that be all right? Hmm. So the remaining states have passed executive orders, which also go against the letter and spirit of Supreme Court's directions. I'm fight, I mean, now the battle is to ensure implementation of the Supreme Court judgment in the states. And also, uh, I'm also trying to get the acts passed by the state governments declared ultra wires because they go against the spirit of Supreme Court's directions. Now, interesting thing is that after the passage of the Supreme Court, as the monitoring was being done, uh, Justice Thomas Committee was appointed in 2008 to check on the uh, implementation at the ground level. Because we kept on saying to the Supreme Court that they are not doing this, they are not doing that. They thought that this is a petitioner, what do you think about this? I don't know, this is a joke. So I said, all right, you appoint your man. So that is how Justice Thomas was appointed. Now, that's just for Justice Thomas, it was too much of a, too much of a work. Uh, but anyway, somehow he did it with the assistance of an IPS officer who was given to him. And he produced some kind of a wishy-washy report, where he also said that he expressed his dismay over the total indifference <coughs> to the issue of reforms in the functioning of the police by the state governments. Now, this was one observation by one uh, judicial commission. Then in 2012, if you recall, there was a, this Nirbhaya incident. No, Nirbhaya incident, after, in the wake of that, Justice Verma committee was appointed to suggest amendments in the criminal law so that women and uh, girl, girls are ma made more secure in the country. Now, in that report, if you care to turn over the pages of Justice Verma committee, one full chapter, I think 28 pages, are devoted to police reforms. Justice Verma's contention was that, look, you can't, <coughs> you can't uh, uh, take up the issue of women and, ch uh, and girl child in isolation. It is a problem which has to be taken up in its totality. Once the police improves, then this thing will also be taken care of. Other problems which we are faced with will also be taken care of. He wanted an integrated and a holistic approach to the problem of police reforms, and so he devoted 28 pages to police reforms. And this is what he recorded. We believe that if the Supreme Court direction in Prakashing, I mean, the case is now known as Prakashing, instead of saying Prakashing case, uh, that if Supreme Court directions uh, in Prakashing are implemented, there will be a crucial modernization of the police to be service oriented for the citizenry in a manner which is efficient, scientific, and consistent with human dignity. But neither Justice Thomas Committee recommendation nor Justice Verma Committee recommendation had any, had any effect on our rulers. Now, there are several other, I mean, when, when we are talking of internal security challenges and what needs to be done, there are several other areas which, which require attention. Manpower. Manpower, where we are very deficient. The world standard is 220 per lack of population. We, on paper, have 182, and on ground, we have 139. Why 182 on paper? Because that is the sanctioned strength. There are vacancies, huge vacancies, so on the ground, boots on the ground are 139 only. So that is the problem about manpower, then the infrastructure. When I talk of infrastructure, I mean transport, I mean communications, I mean forensics. All these are, there are huge uh, deficiencies in all these. I won't be able to go into the detail. Housing is another matter 
I mean, I mean it, housing is something which gives you satisfaction. And government is committed to be giving housing to 100% police staff. But the housing is, it is just between 25 to 30%. That's all the housing that we have got. Working hours, there are no working hours for Indian policemen. Working hours are 24 hours. And several studies have been conducted in the matter by McKinsey, by National Police Commission, by Bureau of Police Research. They all present a very dismal and a very agonizing picture of the daily life of a policeman who is posted in a police station. The man completes his uh, hours of duty, goes back home. He's hardly having his meal that he gets a phone call, ki nebiya, ye musibat aagai, bhaag kya ho? So he finishes half his meal, I mean, he just gulps his meal and then he's again on duty. It's a terrible state uh, in terms of working hours. Then training, training area has also not received the attention it deserved. Modernization is proceeding at a very lackadaisical pace. Commissioner system in South Indian states has been accepted, but in North there's a huge resistance to accepting the commissioner system. CCTNS is a scheme which is to uh, link all the stations, which is to link all the stations uh, of the country so that once they are uh, linked, any information about crime and criminals can be with the click of them, uh, with the click on your computer, you can get to know what is what. Is what. NAD grid is to improve your, uh, yeah, improve your uh, anti-terror capabilities. Concurrent list and federal crimes, this is something that I think you must know. You see, our, the founding fathers of our constitution, they placed uh, police and public order in the, in, the con in the state list of the Indian constitution, in the seventh schedule. Now, at that time, I suppose, to be just fair to them, they could not have foreseen about the kind of problems that India would be faced, say, 50, 60, or 70 years hence. Those days, the problems were very, very simple. Theft, murder, decoity, robbery, chain snatching, cycle theft. These were, the no these were the normal crimes when we started our career. But now, the problems, I mean, the pro problems of a different character, of different dimensions are there. Our terrorist problem, it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. How do you deal with it? Uh, say, say, drug trafficking. Drug trafficking will start from Myanmar, Manipur border. Drugs will be smuggled in. From Manipur, probably somehow it will travel to Delhi. From Delhi, it will travel to West Asia. From West Asia, it will go to North America. From North America, probably some will find its way to South America. So this is a huge uh, network of drug trafficking, money laundering, arms trafficking, what we call organized crime. Organized crime was unknown earlier. But now organized crime has very serious dimensions. Point I'm trying to, and forget about the organized crime. If you I mean, you, the, the condition in the states today is that the slightest incident happening anywhere, whether of a communal nature or caste riot or reservation problem or whatever, immediately central forces are called. And round the year, central forces are deployed in every state of the country. Now, if you're incapable of managing law and order in the state with your own resources, then why should this be in the state list? As simple as that. So it should be brought to the concurrent list. But the moment you talk of bringing it to concurrent list, every chief minister is going to say it's an attack on the federal character of the constitution. They, you are invading our turf. I mean, all these things will arise. And therefore, just uh, for fear of antagonizing the state chief ministers, no central government has, has had the courage to take up this matter yet. I have a different solution. All right. If you are not able to bring it in the concurrent list, have some have what is called a federal crimes, as they have in USA. There are certain crimes are defined as federal crimes. And the second administrative commission, uh, administrative reforms commission, said that these crimes should be categorized as uh, federal crimes. That included uh, uh, terrorist crime, money laundering, and certain other crimes. And, <laughs> the, and certain investigati investigative agencies at the center, say like CBI, NIA, they should be given the responsibility for, all right, you will investigate these cases, you will investigate these cases. That will also take care of the problem if you are not able to bring it in the concurrent list. Now, these are the huge problems. I mean, as I said, so, the, so what is the problem? I mean, the question was, can the police cope with it? Yes, the police is capable of coping with it. And the police in India, in spite of all the constraints, in spite of all the handicaps, in spite of all the resource crunch, 
they have produced phenomenal results on occasions. I will give you a couple of examples. Punjab terrorism. One of the most lethal manifestations of terrorism anywhere in the world. You were probably not born there then. I was there in the thick of the battle. I was there in the thick of the battle and when this was happening. And let me tell you, as Inspector General, I was not sure that I'll be able to, with all my commitment, dedication, and my 40 battalions putting in day and night of work, we were not confident that we will be able to retain Punjab as part of India. It was so dreadful. Every time I moved out of my campus, BSF campus, I was not sure whether I'll come back in one piece. But then I had to go. So that, I, what I'm saying, and this Punjab terrorism was controlled and vanquished. And not, not, not by bureaucrats, not by politicians, not by engineers, not by doctors, <laughs> by policemen. Yes, by the, by the police. And there were three police officers who did it. Don't ask me their names. You should know. So that was Punjab was one. Another example, Tripura again. Tripura had, I don't think you are very familiar, anybody from the northeast here? Which state? Eh? Sikkim. So you would not know about Tripura. About Tripura people do not know. But Tripura had a full-blown insurgency. That was also controlled entirely by the state police. Terai area of UP. Anybody from UP? Many. There would be many, from, but you would not know what happened in Terai. Uh, what happened in Terai had an overflow of Punjab terrorism. On a scale of 10, if Punjab was, say, 9, UP was, say, something like 4.5. It was quite bad. But the beauty of controlling terrorism in Tarai was that it was controlled without any bad blood, without any hard feelings, without any feeling that police committed atrocities, committed cold-blooded murders. I didn't want to say that, but I was the DGP then. And we vanquished this in less than a year. Just, about, just one year. Then another example. Uh, from undivided Andhra Pradesh, Naxal problem. Naxal problem was mainly in Andhra Pradesh. But the Andhra Pradesh police, with their fantastic intelligence, I know it's fantastic intelligence, but it was, I spent four months in Andhra Pradesh conducting an inquiry into the assassination attempt on Chandra Babu Naidu. It was a, they have fantastic intelligence uh, with, uh, backed by greyhounds. They have an elite commando force. It's an absolutely top-class force. Greyhounds backed by first-class intelligence, they almost wiped out the Naxals from Andhra. And they had to move. That is where, that is the time when they had to move to Chhattisgarh, to Jharkhand, to other places. But yeah, it is too hot. Let us go to other states. So, I mean, police in India is capable of achieving phenomenal results, provided you give them the backing, you give them the support, you give them the resources. They can deal with these internal security challenges, but there are huge constraints today. And particularly, the working conditions are terrible. I'm talking not so much in terms of, mat of, of material comforts. What I'm talking of is the environment in which policemen has to work. An honest police officer finds it very difficult to survive in the kind of ambience that we have. I mean, one of my interviews were published in the legal journal of Delhi, where somehow he picked up this heading, can an, hon can a, can an honest police officer survive? This was I said, and he made it the caption because he found it, he found it interesting. It is, it is really difficult, but it's still, I mean, I would say that being an honest officer is still ensures you that yet the, graph, the graph continues to go up. Maybe it has slight, uh, slight uh, I mean, so downward uh, depressions, but ultimately it manages to go up. So I will, I will not say that if you are, I don't know, sir, those in IIT also sit for competitions and some of you may land up in police also. So don't start with wrong ideas. Start on the right note, start with the right ideals, and uh, ultimately in the long run, 
it means it means a lot of traumatic experience it means a lot of suffering it means a lot of uh, unfortunate experiences but in the end i think you you emerge triumphant so police can deal with these internal security changes but they require governmental support in terms of resources in terms of manpower in terms of uh, infrastructure and in terms of the environment in which they have to function that is also very important i mean today you know i mean not only police but uh, uh, crp bsf uh, indian army they are all in the dock over these manipur killings and uh, what the supreme court has been trying to do that everybody should be tried for murder this that so i mean the society has to understand that here are people working under conditions where which are extremely difficult when they are when they are risking their lives if you if you sort of treat any casualty on the other side as a murder then nobody is going to lift the rifle uh, in the course of performing internal security duties so the right environment has to be created and the police will be able to deal with internal security challenges but if that environment is not created we shall be sort of in in a sad state and uh, struggling to keep our head above water but that's what all i had to say uh, thank you very much for giving me a patient hearing thank you sir for your enlightening talk we would now like to throw the floor open for questions from the audience kindly raise your hand if you have a question and the mic will be passed on to you good evening sir um, first of all thank you for that wonderful speech and also a salute from all of us for all the great things that you've done in the past uh, i have a few questions uh, based on a few issues that you raised in your speech uh, first uh, it's just three small questions first about the separatist issues if a large group of citizens of the country have a problem coexisting in india uh, do we not deserve to hear them out and try to resolve the discontentment of the people as long as it's not a misguided few trying to speak for all that is um secondly when does a group when does a radicalized outfit qualify as a terrorist as terrorists are only radical muslim groups terrorists or are in there radicalized armed groups in other faiths as well thirdly about uh, nadgrid could you please elaborate what nadgrid is because there are a lot of privacy concerns that sort of surround uh, nadgrid so if you could talk about nadgrid then that would also be great thank you sir first question was about the separatists yes sir you see anybody can ask for separation even a child can ask for separation even a wife can ask for separation but i think we need to lay down some parameters otherwise we we are going to disintegrate everything not only the country but we are going to disintegrate even your family it's not easy getting a divorce or is it it's very difficult you have to run to the court probably 20 30 times before the honorable judge would agree to giving you a divorce it is very difficult why because the society would like you to stay together would like to go into the details of the circumstances why you want to separate and only when they are convinced now in a huge country like india known for its plurality known for its diversity if you start conceding the demand of separation then i think you are done it will not it will it will not end with jnk it will not end with nagaland it will not end with uh, khalistan probably you will be left with just uh, up bihar and uh, maybe uh, rajasthan that's it even tamil nadu may say oh we we also want a separate country there are people talking on those so 
what, what is the psychology behind this kind of separation? Some kind of theoretical arguments can always be manufactured, seemingly convincing. But the, the larger consideration of unity has to prevail. And I think uh, national, uh, I mean, there, there's a thing like maintaining the integrity of the country. And we can say that, all right, within this framework, within the framework of the Constitution, if you have any legitimate demands, that can be considered. But if you think of going outside the Constitution, breaking, breaking away from the country, then that is unacceptable. There has to be an area where we can negotiate. There has to be an area which is not non-negotiable. So I think that is where we have to uh, tackle the separatist movements and say no. As it is, Kashmir ha has a sep has a status much, much better than all the states of the Union. And now you want separation also. I mean, at some stage, we have to say that thus far and no further. <clears throat> that was one. Then secondly, you said radicalization and terrorism. Just what qualifies as a terrorist group? As in what, mm, when does yes. an, a radicalized outfit become a terrorist group? The terrorism, firstly, there is no definition of terrorism. But what constitutes terrorism is generally understood. That you take a resort to illegal means, you try to perpetrate violence, you try to create terror, and by terror means spreading fear, fear of the unknown. When and where, what would happen, nobody knows that kind of fear. <clears throat> so mere radicalization does not mean that he has become a terrorist. Once he starts perpetrating an incident, you see, what is there in your mind is your business. So long as it does not take an overt form, so long as it remains confined to your mind, the society will not bother you. But the moment you try to implement those ideas into practice, and those ideas manifest themselves in the form of a, an act, which is considered a terrorist act, then you are branded as a terrorist. But so long as your theories, however revolutionary, or however disruptive, not revolutionary, however disruptive, so long as they remain confined to your coconut, it's OK. Go ahead. Keep it with you. The third point was about uh, <coughs> NAT grid. Uh, see, there are issues. Firstly, this NAT grid, as it is, it is making slow progress. Uh, there's a whole lot of data which will be made available to the intelligence agencies only for counter terror purposes, for no other purpose. Uh, I don't think there are any serious issues involved, but if you are <coughs> engaged in something disruptive, then it should be possible for government to access some database which is available with NatGrid. That is the objective. So that takes care of your three questions. We can have, but uh, what, what purpose will be served uh, with a dialogue between a professional army and a rogue army, I really don't know. My name is I'm from And question is, is Sir, please, that's something different. Um, my question is, um, what do uh, the, the, that you talked about left-wing terrorism, what stake do the people in um, elite circles, so-called elite circles, have to uh, invest in the left-wing terrorism? Because I was just reading, and uh, there was a regiment raised in 2003, I think. It was called the Salwa Judum. And it was a local regiment to tackle, tackle the Naxal problem. But um, after some uh, uh, complaints to the Supreme Court by certain people, I won't name them, you might know them, uh, it was taken back because uh, they said they were rogue and they were improperly trained. 
but the, the, the regiment uh, as it is were local people and they had a uh, better uh, idea of the culture and the geography of the location. But then, it, it, even then, it was still decommissioned. And we have another uh, th uh, th uh, th uh, regiment of that kind. It's, a, it's, a, it's called the Bastaria Battalion. Even that is operating right now. But people still want that to be decommissioned. So w what stake do these people have in decommissioning such anti-insurgency uh, groups? And uh, uh, one, more, one more fact in the same uh, uh, Naxal th that we call a Red Corridor, there is a huge extortion money. There are facts placed by uh, IG Kalluri. Uh, he says that there is a huge extortion money that is uh, taken from uh, this Red Corridor, and it is pumped into urban areas, according to the statistics uh, mentioned by uh, IG Kalluri. So what does that have? with the people who are raising these kind of complaints against anti-insurgency groups. Thank you, sir. You see, there is in this country a very articulate, highly educated group <coughs> which supports the Naxal ideology. <coughs> like, say, Arundhati Roy. Then you have another uh, in the Delhi University, Kya Naam Hiska. The Delhi University professor. So there are a whole lot of very intelligent, very articulate people who support the Naxal ideology. And uh, then there are some very honest and well-meaning bureaucrats, but not well-informed, I would say, like A.S. Sharma, who stays in, I think, Vijayawada. A very fine officer, I know. But when you do not understand full implications of something, your honesty sometimes uh, takes you in the wrong direction. You may be intellectually honest, but how well informed you are about the ground situation, that also needs to be understood. Now, these people uh, mounted a campaign against Salva Judum. Look, I have seen Salva Judum. By the way, I have written books on Naxal movement, published in India, France, and USA. Uh, the one in India is published by Rupa & Co. So, I have seen, I have been to Salva Judum camps, I have seen what it is like. You see, across the world, it is acknowledged by all counter-insurgency experts that one of the ways to defeat any insurgent movement is that the local people should rise against them or should be mobilized against them or that they should be motivated to sort of take a stand against them. So Salva Judum was born, was born out of this counter-insurgency approach. It was a legitimate movement. But they kept on uh, mounting a campaign against it. Just for your information, uh, there was a um, planning commission had appointed a, a group, an expert group they called it, to study what they called development challenges in extremist affected areas. I was part of that group. And while preparing that report, we had they wrote one chapter on Salva Judum. I did not agree with that. I and Doval were part of uh, that uh, expert group. So Doval, Doval said, Sir, aap jo likhna likh deje, I will support it. So I wrote against it. And I said, look, if this chapter is not removed, I am not going to sign the report. So then they prepared a separate, wall, a separate note of dissent one main report to which we subscribed and one another report to which we did not subscribe. I did not subscribe to decommissioning of Salva Judum, but the, but the Supreme Court also, you see, the judges do not know what's happening on the ground. <coughs> and they are carried away by rhetoric, they are carried away by uh, expression of liberal values uh, in the air-conditioned Supreme Court chamber. I know what the Supreme Court chamber is like. I have been going there for donkey's years. So people really, they do not have their feet on the ground. And it was a wrong judgment on their part to have uh, passed an order against Salva Judum. But then it happened. But uh, the, thanks to Chhattisgarh government, they put old wine in a new bottle and the same boys were uh, taken in the Chhattisgarh police. 
Then about uh, this Bastaria battalion, is there a campaign to decommission them also? I'm, I'm not aware, but uh, you see, this is this would again be, because once you have a battalion, the in a recruitment in a battalion is done according to certain yardsticks, uh, norms, norms about height, about weight, about chest, about your ability to run 400 meters, about your ability to undergo an obstacle course, etc., etc. I, mean, I don't know what is the present format, but that is how it used to be. Now, if you have qualified uh, in those tests. And you have, if you have been recruited after following a proper uh, recruitment procedure, then the question of uh, anybody opposing it should not arise. And if anybody does, the Supreme Court should have sense uh, to reject any such petition. I do not know at what stage it is. Um, so, if I may, huh. uh, the, the, in in the legal battle against Salva Judum, I think it was uh, since since we are, uh, you have named a person, it was actually Nandini Sundar who did uh, that. Nandini, why Delhi University professor me kya raha Nandini ya Sundar. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> in this case, in the Bastar Battalion, uh, Bastaria Battalion, uh, as you said, the norms of height, weight, and other fitness levels. I've read about that also. The, one of the arguments is that they have been relaxed. No, they they are always relaxed. You see, for Bhutanese, hmm. for Nepalese, for hill people, they are always relaxed. That that. That so one of the about. arguments is that, that it is relaxed, that is why it should not be... But then you have to remove the Indian Army, all the Gurkhaos, all the Bhutanese, all the Ladakhi, 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 all the Ladakhi. So then uh, why, why is the, I mean, uh, I mean, the impression that uh, we get is that why is the uh, police force or whoever is, uh, is supposed to be uh, pro this, uh, these kind of uh, counter-insurgency operations, why are they not able to make watertight cases against uh, the supposed uh, liberal valued people. So th that is the question, sir. Uh, you want uh, Nandri Sundar to be booked and you want Arvind. <laughs> right. Let them, let, as it is, there is so much of uh, criticism that uh, dissident voices are being silenced and this and that. It's a free democracy, almost chaotic democracy. Uh, <laughs> Charu, not Charum. Eh? Charu, Charu Dutt, thank God, not Mazumdar. Do not have the capability of like joining armed forces or police forces can do to support these people. Well, in whatever capacity you can, wherever there is opportunity, uh, speak speak out your convictions. You can write about them, you can speak about them. If there are any NGOs, you can uh, you can lend support to those NGOs, become for become a part of those NGOs which are campaigning for these. There are various fora where you can uh, lend your support, even as a citizen. The problem today is that people in general have not understood the relevance and importance of police reforms. I have always said, I have not been able to detail this point, that if you want India to be a progressive, modern country taking its place on the high table in the Security Council and in the Committee of Nations, then there's no getting away from a progressive, modern police force. We must have it. And if you are not going to have it, the greatest threat is to the economic uh, development of the, of the country. As I wrote in a, <coughs> in a Hindi uh, newspaper, कि मोदी जी अपने आर्थिक प्रगति का ढांचा बालू के ढेर पर खड़ी कर रहे हैं। You see why I wrote that? What happened in Haryana? What happened in Haryana? I, I was asked to conduct an inquiry in the uh, reservation agitation, and I found that 20,000 crore worth of property was devastated in 15 days. Can you believe it? Do teen agitation or kar dije, Haryana will go to Stone Age. I wrote in my report that if the Lashkar e Toiba and Jashe Muhammad were given a free run of the country for 15 days, even they would not have been able to inflict so much damage as the reservationists did in Haryana. You need good law and order. If you don't have good law and order, if you don't have a reliable police force, then God save Haryana and God save any other state. We'll now take our last question.
भाई मुझे जल्दी नहीं है <laughs> बच्चों को बच्चों को जाना हो तो मुझे आपने तो मैं तो पाँच बजे से साढ़े छः बजे के लिए आया था आपने मुझे सीधे एयरपोर्ट से मुझे सीधे यहाँ बुला लिया <laughs> चलिए ओन एनी वे यू हैव अ टाइम शेड्यूल सॉरी आई विल नॉट इंटर इंटरफेयर विद योर टाइम शेड्यूल चलिए हेलो सर माय नेम इज़ पीयूष आई एम फ्रॉम यूपी एंड यू नो सीरियस नाउ डेज सम सीनियर पुलिस ऑफिसर लीडिंग इन फ्रंट ऑफ योगी आदित्यनाथ सी एम and uh, after two or three days some kamadia break some uh, police officers car or something bolero or something so and uh, many of the posara jo uh, ig dig officer they are uh, coming regarding their religious just uh, mulayam singh yadav came then many of the police officer are muslim community they are dg ig something in uh, adityanath hindus they are something and uh, there is spreading flowers on such community kavadiya on then so and they are also hating uh, they are uh, demolishing that uh, public uh, public uh, public property so how can you think that uh, and these police officers are also uh, for responsible that see demolition? one of the problems which has uh, which we are faced with which i had no occasion to touch upon mm -hmm. is the politicization of officers You see, most of the officers today carry an invisible stamp on their foreheads. Invisible, I say, yes. that I belong to this party or I am sympathetic to this party or I am. Most of these officers, not 100 percent. Even in Tamil Nadu, I think ye DMK ka hai, ye na DMK ka hai, ye iska hai, ye uska. Ye, it is common, very common. So similarly in UP, they will say ye BSP ka hai, ye Samajwadi ka hai, ye Congress ka hai, ye Mulayam Singh ka hai, vagara vagara. Politicization has been one of the uh, one of the most uh, uh, i mean pernicious effects of uh, the kind of police structure that we have now that being so i mean i don't justify some anybody kneeling before the yogi adityanath no it is not it's never done especially if you in uniform it must never be done but you are talking wo to aadmi jo kneel kiya you know he was the deputy superintendent of police there are photographs of commissioners touching the feet of the chief minister at at, at the tarmac he gets down from the plane and commissioner goes like that so this thing has been there it's part of uh, you can say uh, it's not a good culture but it has been there when kamlapati tripathi was the chief minister of up people say i did not have the fortune to for misfortune of serving under him <laughs> he he would keep his legs like that on the table that when you come and see me you don't have to bend aap pair wahi chhu lijiye ye ye purane zamane ki baat hai kamlapati tripathi ki to ye to raha aapke uske baad now that officer showering petals i think it is just graceful because he is an officer of the rank of additional dg and i thought well of him but uh, i am ashamed of what i saw on, in the photographs and the video it is just not done you have to maintain religious neutrality i always i mean in my talks to young police officer i say that look whatever you god you worship i don't care aap jiski man ho puja kar lo but when you are outside once you have put on the uniform then your your religion is the constitution that is your religion <laughs> I, i hope i hope that is answered chaliye boliye अभी बोलिए पीछे मत देखिए you see the problem has to be dealt with at different levels it has to be dealt with politically diplomatically and also on the ground now politically in the sense that at least in punjab you should 
uh, you should create an atmosphere where such forces do not get any traction. And whichever forces are in power, whichever, whichever political party is in power, is, is in the saddle, they pursue enlightened policies, enlightened policies so that six uh, do not have any feeling of alienation. You see, these feelings, I mean, strictly speaking, come up only when there is a feeling of alienation. Now, to what extent these feelings are genuine? To what extent are these feelings being fueled and funded by Pakistan? That is another matter. So, you have to deal with this problem at home. See, you, you may be aware, since you have raised this question, uh, they sponsored killings, these Khalistani, pro-Khalistan elements sponsored killings of RSS, uh, but six or seven RSS men were killed in Punjab. The idea was to create a religious divide. Fortunately, nothing of the kind happened, and the cases were, thanks to Suresh Arora, is one of the good directors general of police that we have in Punjab. So he got the cases worked out, and we knew who the villains were. So at the ground level, the police has to do its job, the politician has to do its job, and at the international level, government must take up these matters with UK and with Canada. You see, the problem with UK and Canada, UK, the problem with UK is that they have still not understood how times are changing, where their own liberal values are taking them. I mean, U, UK is almost finished and so is Europe. I mean, the kind of reports that I read on, on the net every day, I get a whole lot of international news from different fora. Things are really bad. Things are really bad and Europe, long back I read an article that Europe will one day become Eurabia. So, so it, is, it is moving in that direction. It may not have become Eurabia, but it is moving in that direction. Uh, but some people are still not prepared to open their eyes. They still talk of uh, human rights and free speech and all that free speech is fine, human rights is fine, but there has to be a limit to that also. Otherwise, too much of human rights, uh, then you disintegrate the country. Too much of, too, ma too many liberal values, you allow, I mean, a man who is not allowed to live in his own country comes to UK and he becomes a prominent person and he is always pouring venom against, uh, against the West. And they say, oh no, it's okay, free speech, let so we, at the political level, we have to take it up with Canada and UK. Thank you, sir, for your insightful lecture. I'm sure that the knowledge you have imparted and the ideas you have shared will continue to inspire us as we move forward. As a mark of our gratitude, may I request Professor Sudarshan Patmanabhan to felicitate the speaker with a memento. May I also request you, sir, to kindly leave us a message in the EML yearbook. I request all of you to kindly remain in the auditorium as we would be playing the national anthem at the end. We wish to express our heartfelt gratitude to Mr. Prakash Singh for his presence here with us today. I also take this opportunity to thank all those whose invaluable support in organizing this lecture has contributed to its success. 